morning. Marvin Sylvester here again. Yeah, where are we today? Well, we here back again at San Fernando Hill in South Trinidad. Um, today is the 16th of April 2023. As you can see, the weather is a little overcast. We have a little sun. Um, we have some clouds. Hopefully, it doesn't rain. And um, I hope all is well with you. All is well with me, as usual. And um, first things first, as usual, um, thank you to everyone who has been watching our videos, liking, subscribing, sharing, um, helping the community to grow. I greatly appreciate your engagement with the channel. Um, please, I ask that you continue to like share subscribe you know and you know i will continue to keep trying to do my best to put out content on things that you know um, i believe would be important to you so this week i'm going to firstly cover um to continue our the discussion that we started from last week on the dollarization right so i'll be covering some other things on that that will be our main topic this week and then i'll also cover some other local stories and um you, as as usual in the last few videos i'm gonna end up with a end off sorry with an update on alpha nero as i've been doing so i'll, I'll, I'll give you the latest updates in that um alpha nero mega yacht um saga right so we'll continue that so so to kick things off I mean the main topic i want to start off with a couple quotes right which analysts are giving uh, are being linked to the dollarization right the dollarization movement or the effort the global effort kind of thing right and these comments were made by world leaders and um let's see if you could guess who these world leaders are right i'm gonna go into them here now. so the first quote was from a european leader i'll give you one hint there where they were saying something to the effect that europe should reduce its dependence on the quote extraterritoriality of the u.s dollar end quote i'll read it again they were saying that Europe should reduce its dependence on the, quote, extraterritoriality of the U.S. dollar. The person also went on to say, if tensions between two superpowers heat up, we don't have the time nor the resources to finance our strategic autonomy, and we will become vassals. Any ideas on who you think made that statement? Well... If you guessed French President Emmanuel Macron, you guessed correctly. French President Emmanuel Macron made those words. Alright. Here's the second quote. So this is, I'll give you one hint. This is from a South American, the leader of a South American country, right? Let's see if you could guess it person said very recently why can't we do trade based on our own currencies he said per the financial times who was it that decided that the dollar was the currency after the disappearance of the gold standard any guesses come to mind well if you guess the president of brazil mr luis ignacio lula de silva you guess correctly you guess correctly so we have the french president made one statement and the brazilian president made one statement and, and, and just a little background huh? president lula was also one of the f presidents who was the founder of BRICS at the time right BRICS, b-r-i-c-s and if you don't know what BRICS is, it is a common acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South America. These group of countries have been 
closely interacting with each other on an economic level and I hope to do something about them specifically in a future video right but we're going back to France and Brazil for now now keep in mind as I said before that these are two of the main countries that we deal with in the Western Hemisphere and they are mentioning the leaders of these countries are speaking about de-dollarization right so remember I was speaking about a, a website called trend economy and i was giving you all some 2021 statistics some of the most recent statistics on who our import and export partners are let's just focus on france and brazil right so as per trend economy statistics 2021 statistics in terms for france they were our number four export partner right france we had, had about 3.65 percent of exports to france sending stuff to them at approximately 315 million us dollars right and brazil was our number nine export partner with 2.62 percent of exports sending stuff to brazil that was valued at 225 million us dollars and our number four import partner who we bring in things from right Brazil was 5.6% um, of imports, 323 million US dollars. So just some food for thought. I just thought I'd bring that back up because countries that, how to put it, last week I was discussing countries mostly in Asia would have mentioned what certain things China was doing, certain things what India was doing. And I was mentioning Asian markets and ideally we don't really do much import and export with Asian markets. I'll just show you the contrast where now you have France and Brazil, two of the countries that we mainly do business with, talking about the dollarization. So food for thought, right? Now, last week I defined de-dollarization I defined some I gave examples of some of the countries that were doing it but you know the, the activities they were taking but in order to give balance I decided I also wanted to show what the other side is saying in terms of what the skeptics are saying because I believe it's important to give balance right I'm even though I might have my own personal thoughts and things, it's important to show both sides of the of the coin. And there are people who are skeptical about de-dollarization or who believe that de-dollarization can't happen, ever. So, with that being said, in doing my little online reading, I came across this article from the American Institute for Economic Research, right? It was dated the 11th of April 2023 the title of the article was de-dollarization has begun redux and it was written by a, a contributor to um, the American Institute for Economic Research a gentleman by the name of Peter C. Earle right so the article takes a sort of question and approach style um, they have several points that were listed, questions that were given, and he sort of answering the questions, right? Because apparently people were asking him questions, and he's, he's just giving the answers. So I'll go into some of those points, right? So let's go. First question. Is the reduction in use, when brackets, or complete abandonment of the dollar as the global reserve currency something I should be worried about? So... Um, these are questions most likely coming from his American readers, American audience, right? And he answers. Almost certainly not. A few points need to be made here. First, barring a truly extraordinary event or series of developments, a scenario in which the dollar is no longer used, in brackets at all, in international trade is highly unlikely. The prospect of such a thing happening in a short period of time, days, weeks, months, or even a few years, is virtually impossible. 
The size and breadth of the U.S. economy and our vast trading relationships virtually assure that to some extent or another, the dollar will remain, at the very least, among the top currencies used to denominate and or settle global transactions. Now, you listen to that, there's a, there's a little play on words. The, the author is acknowledging that, barring something extremely out of the ordinary happening, certain things can happen. Fair enough. Let's go on to point two. Question was, what are the odds that the Chinese yuan will transplant the dollar as the currency of choice in world trade? His response was, At present, even beyond the decades that such a change would probably take, the likelihood of the yuan becoming the global reserve currency ranges between profoundly unlikely to essentially impossible. That is his response. Point three. Well, question three. What are the most viable candidates among currencies to replace the dollar or take market share from it, if any? His response was, let's return to two core assertions. First, that a more probable scenario is for the dollar to be joined by other currencies in a multi-reserve currency regime than to be replaced outright. Okay. And second, that the currencies of China and others that are pegged are improbable replacements for the U.S. dollar. It bears remembering that there are transactions of considerable volumes and sizes which take place in other currencies every day other than the dollar. He also states an estimated 95% of the world dollar payments are settled via SWIFT. And he also goes on to state several other statistics, right? Okay, fair enough, but I, 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 I want to just state some statistics just to keep balance here, right? Now, also in my reading, I would have come across certain information and one of them was from the Financial Times, right? Which was stating that the one share of global trade finance has more than doubled from less than 2% in February 2022 to 4.5% a year later. So, when the, what are they talking about there? Global market share. How much people are using one to conduct their transactions has increased from less than 2% in February 2022 and over doubled to 4.5% by February 2023. Right? And it, they also say that those gains put China's currency in close contention with the euro, which accounts for about 6% of the total of global market share in terms of business being done with that currency. The article also went on to say that both are, however, still a fraction of the dollar share, which currently stands at 84.3% in February 2023, but down from 86 point eight percent a year earlier in February 2022 and an analysts are saying that this is a significant shift right to so think about it as I said China going up over two percent from less than two percent to four point five the US has gone down in terms of global market share the currency being used to settle transactions food for thought just had in balance so I'll skip in point four from what he said, so I'm going to question five. If one, ruble, and other currencies are no match for the dollar, why are some other countries beginning to transact in them? His response was, it's a question of trade-offs. Transacting in less liquid currencies is bound to be a bit more inefficient, more costly, and involve more underdeveloped, thus possibly error-prone, practices and technology than in established dollar and euro systems. But given the increasing use of the dollar as a means of imposing sanctions, some foreign powers see a pressing need to develop the capability to transact outside US dollar based systems. We are witnessing the development of financial contingency plans. 
The possibility also exists that recent Federal Reserve missteps, in particular those which led to the highest inflation in 40 years, are feeding an instinct to develop hedges against U.S. monetary policy. National pride is undoubtedly a factor as well. It's probably difficult for autocratic regimes to convince their populations that everything under, is, is under control when most business is conducted in U.S. dollars. Imagine the dissonance arising from a state trying to convince its citizenry that it is protecting them from Yankee imperialists even as most of the population eagerly seek to acquire currency with pictures of Washington, Lincoln, or Hamilton on it. That is the views of the author, right? But here's the last question here. Question six. It sounds as if there really isn't much to worry about. What is the point of discussing this now? His response. And this is the most important response I believe in this whole article. New reserve currency ideas and proposals go back a long way. But recent developments suggest a distinct ratcheting up of projects explicitly pursuing non-dollar trading relationships. Pause. In my opinion, right there and there, the author acknowledges that de-dollarization to some extent is taking place. He also says, the knock-on effects of changes of this sort even developing gradually may be far may be more far reaching than anyone may envision is acknowledging that even though these sorts of transactions which are ratcheting up in non-dollar currency even though they may gradually develop may have more significant effects than anybody could perceive right now also says this is especially the case considering that unleashing the full potential of comparative advantage requires trade and he finishes by saying taking note of these developments even as they slowly unfold is in the best interest of all americans so in my opinion even though this author takes a very skeptical approach throughout strongly believes in the power of the US dollar, US dollar based systems, and US continuing to be, if not the most used reserve currency or, or, or what not. In my opinion, they do acknowledge that the dollarization is taking place. It is happening to some degree. They do not know the future outcome of this even slow gradual action and they are encouraging their audience to pay very close attention to it. So again all of this information is just food for thought, right? A show in opposite views different sides of the spectrum here. I showed you all quotes from world leaders, President of France, President of Brazil, our trading partners. Last week's video I've shown countries in the East. We highlighted China buying LNG for the first time from the UAE. 65,000 tons of LNG in one. Talked about India buying oil in their rupees, currencies, right? I'm also now showing a different perspective from a contributor to the American Institute for Economic Research, right? At the end of the day, I believe I just need to put the information out there and you can decide. But it's important that you for yourself keep up to date on these things i believe that the dollarization is happening me personally and we need to we here in trinidad and tobago should be aware of it and take steps to deal with it as it gradually grows because as even this author acknowledges 
who knows what's going to happen down the road right so i'll close off there i'll also state that in a future video i will look at some of the ways in which analysts are saying it's best to plan for or hedge against the dollarization i'll, I'll, I'll look at that in a future video so going on to some other stories right so one of the other big stories that stood out to me this week was the sub turning for a new solar plant in central trinidad and kuva right now this story was covered in all the mainstream media but the one in the guardian the Toronto tobago guardian stood out to me the most and i'll i'll share why so i'll go in into it right was a Chan Tobago Guardian article dated the 13th of April 2023. Um, the title of it was Sud Turn for 92 Megawatt Solar Site in Coover. Government plans to allow citizens to sell back to the national grid. It was an article by Kevin Feldman. So I'll just read more as the intro it and then I'll just skip to the part that was most interesting to me. So the article goes. With the third turn for a 92 megawatt Brechin Castle solar site in Cuba, Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley says government will introduce legislation to allow private and corporate citizens to sell power to Tiantec, Tran to, to Big Electricity Commission. In the future address at the site at Phoenix Park Road yesterday, Rowley said this will contribute to the reduction of power generation by power gen, help to reduce TNT's overall carbon emissions, and transfer electricity consumption from gas to sun power. All well and good. As you all know, I am pro um, alternative energy sources, these kind of things, right? I, I, I do support them. But here's the part that jumped out to me the most from in the Guardian article. Raleigh recalled attending COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland in 2021, where there is a suggestion where there was a suggestion that banks should not finance hydrocarbon exploration and extraction to help shut down the use of products that contribute to greenhouse emissions. When he saw people cheering the suggestion, he examined the consequences for TNT if countries adopted it. So a big pause there. People, this is very true. Very, very true because in reading that, I also remembered seeing certain articles where certain banks in Europe did take very aggressive steps to reduce financing for new fossil fuel projects and loans. One was a Swiss bank named UPS, UBS, and the other was a French bank named Credit Mutuel. So this is very, very real. And I think with Credit Mutuel, there was also an actual document that they put out. I'll find that document and I'll try to put it in the link to the in, in, in I'll link to it in the description so that you all could see this banks in Europe have already started saying they're not doing anything with new fossil fuel projects. So food for thought. And the article goes on to state, right? Rowley said TNT lives off the hydrocarbons industry at a time when the world wants change. He said if TNT ignores the push to reduce its carbon footprint, markets will take action against this country and its products. That statement stood out to me as well. For specific reasons. And if you think about it, here what the statement says, markets will take action against this country and its products. You put two and two together. He said TNT signed on to the Paris Agreement and responded by continuing to extract hydrocarbons as it is one of the greatest aspects of the global economy while reducing emissions. We will continue to extract hydrocarbon available to us, oil and gas, as long as there is an international market. If we are going to sell, to the last, sell the last barrel of oil or the last molecule of gas, so be it. But we will do that. We will not get out of the business and leave others to instruct us how to run our affairs. So, I want to see, based on that statement, 
Well said, Prime Minister Rowley. Well said. I respect those words and that position once he means it and he holds fast to it. Because like I've said in a, in, 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 in a couple of videos ago, a couple of weeks ago, we here in Trinidad and Tobago should not sacrifice our national development to pursue energy um, emissions reduction targets or alternative energy targets. And I am sticking with that. And to hear the Prime Minister say that as well, I agree, I support that statement, and I am going to, I am going on the record saying, well said, Prime Minister Rowley. I fully back that statement. Right? So moving on. In some other news, there was also a fire on board at oil platform this week. I'll just cover that quickly. A TNT guard, it was from a TNT Guardian article dated the 13th of April 2023. Subject of the article was fire on a platform. Young, no hydrocarbon emissions reported. I'll just read a brief part of it, right? Four operators working on board an offshore oil platform on the east coast of Trinidad sustained injuries during a small fire aboard the platform. The incident occurred Monday 10th, April 2023 on the Bravo platform operated by Trinity Exploration. So the uh, article goes on to say the guys ended up with some article smoke, smoke related injuries and whatnot. Uh, there were no emissions, it was isolated to one platform and it, it, it wasn't as bad as it could be, right? So thank goodness it wasn't as bad as these kind of incidents could go, right? The other article I wanna, that stood out to me within the last few days was also a Chantibigo Express article dated the 8th of April 2023. Oil production lowest in a generation by Curtis Williams. Right? I'll just read a, a section of it as well. Chantibigo exported just over 19 million barrels of oil in 2022 according to figures from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. But that was 9% decline. That was a 9% decline from the previous year. Right? According to the Ministry's Consolidated Monthly Bulletin, Chan Tobago exported 19,661,005 barrels of oil last year. Right? Chan Tobago's total crude exports in 2022 are however down by just over 2 million barrels when compared to 2021 when the country exported 21,681,344 barrels. The article also states the main reason for the fall in exports is the decline in the production from Heritage Petroleum from 14 million, well just over 14 million in 2021 to 12,394,000 approximately 394,000 in 2022, right? So you had a almost 2 million barrel drop. So put together some not so good news for, for the Chantibigo oil sector in recent times. You had this fire on board the Bravo platform. A few months ago, there was another incident. Um, then we have in figures of low product low production um my hope is that moving forward you know hopefully there are no more incidents and we could get the production back up we know we need the, as a country we need the money we need the resources um so those those things jumped out to me and again like i said i hope moving forward for the rest of the year we get things back up and on track no more incidents right so last but not least last thing i want to cover this week alpha nero mega yacht in antigua well if you follow um the channel you will see that i would have posted up two videos from antigua on the channel this week right and in one of those videos first one 
that video was showing where the Antigua military and protective services actually went on board the boat and seized the boat they've seized it so there's no more who come to claim or who ownership or who not claiming ownership or abandon whatever they actually went on board and they seized the boat they even had a press conference on the boat where i think was um one of the the the, the authorities there were, was giving information to the media about what's going on so they've seized it and in the second video that i would have shared there was another um gentleman um someone with the Antigua Barbuda authorities, I believe, was explaining that they've gone on and seized the boat, and there are, however, U.S. sanctions, I believe, on the vessel. So they've engaged the services of an attorney to write the necessary um, letters and documents to U.S. authorities to try and get the sanctions released from the vessel so that they could put it up for auction and I, I I if you had to put it into a percentage I think it have a 90 something high 90 something percent chance that they it's gonna go through and that vessel is going to be auctioned and I think I also saw in another um, article online that there are approximately 20 bidders already lined up to put in their bid to try and purchase this approximately 120 million dollar um us dollar boat um how much they're gonna get for that boat the antigua barbuda government that is if, if if the boat if or when the boat does actually get auctioned i can't see i doubt it will be the actual value it'll probably be much less if I had to speculate now, because I'm going to keep following this story, as, as I always do, I would speculate they would get approximately, I think, I would say about 80 million US. That is the figure that I run in with. I would say about 80 million US. The highest bid are gonna gonna be somewhere around that vicinity and they will get their hands on that boat and i'm interested to see who is the person or group or entity that gonna get that boat it's a, it's a really nice boat really really nice boat anyway so that brings me to the end of the things that i wanted to cover this week um as usual if you've watched the entire video Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. If you've enjoyed the content, please continue to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell if you haven't done so, so that you can get the notifications um, on when the videos are released. Um, also, if you've really enjoyed the video, um, there will be a link to my Buy Me a Coffee where you can give to the channel so that we can help this channel to grow we are growing we will continue to grow and once again thank you to everyone who's been given support from day one to now and whoever all those who have joined on over time um so that's it for me this week normal thing for me to say is as usual Keep informed, stay vigilant, and please be prepared. Um, have a wonderful day whenever you see in this video. Have a wonderful week ahead, and bye-bye. Take care.